Hello, welcome to another podcast episode. I'm Ray. First of all, Ed. Hello, Ed. Sent me some photos of some cigarette cards. Do you know I was talking about those weeks ago, wasn't I? Months ago, even. And I couldn't find any, well, not any copyright free photos to put on the web page for you all to have a look at. Because a lot of people outside UK, they say, well, what are cigarette cards? What are these fag cards you're on about? Okay, Ed um, is going to send me some, he sent me some pictures, but he said he's going to send me some better ones, some close up ones. So looking forward to that. Now, Mark. Hello, Mark. He had an idea. How about asking people to send in a few ghost stories? Whoa, <laughs> there's a thought. Have you got any ghost stories? Be interested to hear from you. Raise rants at protonmail.com. OK, let's put that away. And what have I got next? Oh, the weather. Quarter to ten, Friday morning. Easter, it's Good Friday, Easter today. So no one's at work. Well, I'm never at work, but no one's at work today. Actually, they are because we've already been up to the, the local range we've got here. And I bought some cabbage plants, which I've just put in. The onions are coming on. The beetroot are coming on. Uh, what else? I've got spring onions. Oh, there's loads of stuff. Leeks. Everything is beginning to happen now. We've got a, a little bit of warmer weather. Nine degrees centigrade at the moment. 48 Fahrenheit. 81% humidity. Beautiful blue sky. 10, 20 millibars on the barometer. The wind is... I'm just looking at the Union flag. which is wrapped round the pole. It's, oh, no, hang on. It can't make up its mind. There's a slight breeze. No, there's not. There's not even a breeze. Moving on. Right, Suzanne. This was her idea. Hello, Suzanne, if you're listening. Punishing children in the old days, sort of then and now. Now, in the 50s and even in the 60s, if you were bad at school, primary school, you know, kids of sort of seven, eight, nine, ten, whatever they were, if you were bad, you've got the, the ruler, you know, the wooden ruler across the back of your, your knuckles. Rap. Oh. <laughs> And, of course, the girls wore skirts and the boys wore shorts. So the teacher could easily slap the backs of your, your calves with this ruler. <laughs> if you were bad. I mean, I wasn't bad, so I didn't get these things. Well, not very often anyway. <laughs> he lied stiffly. So is that a good idea to whack kids with a wooden ruler? I don't know. This is a debate, isn't it, that's been going on recently in the news, you know, on telly and uh, and the radio, people discussing it. Should you spank kids or not? I think now it's illegal, isn't it? I think in uh, Britain it's illegal to smack your children. I'm not too sure. We've never smacked or spanked or hit any of our children. Now, is that because they've been extremely good? We are amazing parents and we've done it all so well. They've never been bad. <laughs> that's not true. I don't think that's the case. Or they're just naturally good kids. No, they haven't been. No, that's not the case either. Uh, they've been bad, but we've never whacked them. I don't think that it's a good idea to inflict physical pain on people because they've done something that they shouldn't. <laughs> I suppose if they're adults, it depends what it is. I don't know. It's a difficult one. A lot of people are saying, bring back the birch at school. You know, there's no discipline in school at all these days, which seems to be true from what I've kind of read and heard, it seems to be the case that there is, or perhaps put it this way, very little discipline compared to the old days. I mean, in the old days, I got the cane. You know, I bunked off school, I played truant, and I got the cane, six of the best, uh, which wasn't nice. A lot of kids got the cane. Our deputy headmaster, he did the caning. I think he enjoyed it. He called his bamboo cane his tickling stick. How about that? used to like his tickling stick. He'd walk round the school with it, walk round the corridors, slapping his leg with his tickling stick. And you know, we, were, we were scared of him. We were. But it didn't stop us being bad. I still played truant. I still bunked off school every Friday afternoon because I didn't like to play sports. And even though I'd had the cane, I was just a little bit more careful about sneaking out of school. Because the time he caught me, I was walking down the long driveway to the road with pushing my bike. My mate had already gone. I said, right, you go first, which he did. Once he was clear, out into the road, across the road, and over to the park, where we'd have a cigarette or two. I followed, my turn to walk down, and I heard this shouting, you boy! I thought, goodness me. 
the headmaster and the deputy headmaster's office was sort of jutting out and looked right down the driveway. Of course, he saw me wheeling my bike down. I had to go back. I couldn't just run because he would have gone round the classes saying, right, who is missing? And he would have discovered that it was me. After the cane, I, I had to go and sit in a classroom on my own, stay after school. And he said, he gave me a load of um, maths questions. I had no good at maths. I couldn't do it. He said, if you get any of those wrong, woe betide you, boy. Woe betide you. And I remember thinking, I wonder what that means. Woe betide you. <laughs> and uh, when I got home, I looked it up. Woe betide you. And I was terrified of going back to school Monday morning because I got all the questions wrong. I haven't got a clue what he's talking about. I can't do maths. I can't even add up. I can't do mental arithmetic, let alone sane arithmetic. Anyway, I thought Monday, that's it. I was going to be woe betided. But nothing happened. He just forgot all about it. And that was the end of that. So I carried on bunking off school every Friday afternoon. And he carried on caning whoever he could that he caught. So happy days all round. I remember a friend of mine, John, I, I got a track bike, you know, with a fixed wheel so it you could pedal both ways. You could pedal forward or backwards. There was no kind of ratchet type thing. And just a front brake on this track bike and the cow horn handlebars, you know, it was for going over the woods and fields and all the rough tracks and stuff. And I went over there with this chap, John. How old were we? I don't think we were at the big school then, as we called it. We were 11. No, no, it must have been yeah, 11 or 12. I don't know. Probably just started at the secondary school. Anyway, that's all beside the point. So we're over the woods and he said, can I have a go on your bike? And I said, yeah, yeah, go on. So off he went and he fell off because he wasn't used to the fixed wheel. He fell off and broke his arm, <laughs> which wasn't really funny at the time. So anyway, he started crying. And I said, oh, it, yeah, does it hurt? He said, no, it's not that. It doesn't hurt much. You could see it was broken because we were in like short sleeve shirts or T-shirts and his arm was sort of zigzagged. Uh, it didn't look normal at all. It was obviously broken. And he said, what are my parents going to say? My dad will go mad. My mum will go mad. What am I going to say? And I said, well, you've only broken your arm. You know, it's not your fault. And he said, no, when, when I tell them I fell off your bike, they've told me don't ride other people's bikes. And I said to him, well, hang on, John. I, this is pretty obvious, really, what you do. You, you don't tell them that you're on my bike. And he sort of looked, oh, oh, right. I, I, looking back, it was bad. He didn't want to lie to his parents. And I was inciting him, I suppose, to tell lies. But to save his skin, he'd already broken his bones. He didn't want his skin broken with a cane as well as his broken bone. So I said, Dude, just go home and tell them that you've, you know, you were just riding along. And I said, make up a story like a car went whizzing past you and you fell off onto the pavement and broke your arm. Didn't get the car registration number, of course. And <laughs> I think he was quite amazed at my sort of lying, my storytelling, because he said to me, do you lie to your parents? Oh, no, no, I said, <laughs> I did, obviously. Where have you been? Nowhere. God, where have you been? Have you been over that so-and-so again? No, I haven't been on the building site. I've been there all day, really. <laughs> oh, dear. But no, they're little white lies, aren't they? How did you break your arm? Well, this car whizzed past and I fell off and that was that. But his parents were strict. They lived not far from where I was down the road. And his mum, they were very old-fashioned. This was, what, early 60s, late 50s. His mum she had the headscarf and she had the, the pinny, you know, the, the big pinny type thing that they'd wear. All women wore those, you know, the, um, I can't describe, well, you know what I mean, but like a big pinafore thing and this headscarf. And, uh, and the dad, when I saw him, I don't know what job he did. He was always at work when I was around there, but once or twice I saw him and he had a, a baggy suit on it, quite a rough old baggy suit and a flat cap and his tie, you know, he was, I don't know what he did. It was some sort of manual work. But in those days, people wore suits. The men would wear a suit, shirt and tie, even if they were a gardener or something like that. They wear the, the tie and a hat. Going back previous to the 50s, they wear a hat. You see the men on the building site. Well, I mean, I wasn't there, obviously, before I was born in 51, so I wasn't there. But you see old things on the telly and they wear a hat to work. <laughs> and they're, they're working on a building site. 
or whatever that manual work they were doing. Quite amazing, really. Anyway, this chap didn't get told off. I went back with him and his mum, you know, she said, oh, what's the matter? And he, he, he told the story, the lie that, <laughs> that I'd come up with. And she was like, oh, you poor thing. Did you get the car number? No, and I said, no, I didn't either. It went past so quickly, nearly nearly hit John. And I, I'm sort of exaggerating. John's looking at me like, yeah, all right, don't go too far, you know. <laughs> but that was okay. They didn't have a car. Not many people had a car in those days. Uh, she didn't have a phone, but she called an ambulance, phone box down the road, went down there, called an ambulance. It was there in minutes, as they were in those days. That's no reflection on the ambulance service these days, I hasten to add. And off he went to the hospital. Next time I saw him, his arm was in plaster and people had written all over it. So I wrote on it, don't fall off your bike. <laughs> Happy days indeed. I remember one or two of the kids at school being, I suppose the word is afraid of their parents. The old saying was, uh, you know, the mum would say, you wait till your father gets home. And that often meant that they'd get the slipper. Now, he'd take his slipper off, you know, his fireside slipper, and he'd sit there with his pipe and listening to the, the BBC Home Service, don't you know? What what <laughs> happy days, BBC. And uh, he'd get his slipper off and, you know, whack the, the boy's bum with this slipper. I didn't get uh, whacked at home. Uh, I don't think any of us kids did in my family. I remember once I was staying at my grandmother's house, only, what, three or four miles away from where I lived, um, and I was staying with them for a few days and I wandered off. They were quite near the railway and I wandered off after breakfast one morning. How old was I? Eight, perhaps. I wandered down to the railway line and there was a crossing, like a, a farm type crossing. And I sat there on this stile and I watched the steam engines go by. And of course, the drivers would wave as they did. Great fun. I used to love the steam engines. And I was there. I had no sense of time. I mean, children don't know what time it is, do they? Even if they've got a watch, it doesn't mean much. I just wandered down there after breakfast and I must have been there much longer than I thought because when I got back, my grandmother, she said, it's 12 o'clock, where have you been? I'll never forget that, 12 o'clock, I wandered off about eight and they'd been looking for me. She said, we've been looking all around the village. They called the police. She said, the police are out looking for you. <laughs> I said, well, I've only been down looking at the steam engines. Oh, you should have said you didn't even say you were going. I don't know why I did that. I often thought afterwards, why did I just wander off? Why didn't I say to her, I'm going down to the railway to look at the engines? Probably because she would have said not on your own. I suppose eight years old. No, I don't know. I think that would have been all right at that age. Anyway, she had to, they did have a telephone. She called the police, and said this, the local police station. You didn't dial 999. You know, you dial the, the local police station because we had local police stations in those days. That's no reflection on the police today, I hasten to add. Yes, it is. We don't have police stations anymore. I think there's one. There's one in my town. All the others have gone. They've gone. Even the one in, in town is, I don't know where it is even. I think they've moved that. Don't see the policeman riding by on his bike. Evening all. He's disappeared. I don't know where he's gone. So she called the local cop shop and said, oh, it's all right, he's come back and he's safe and well. So anyway, I didn't get hit or anything. I can't remember what, I don't think anything happened to me. I think they were just pleased to get me back. I didn't want to phone my parents and say, oh, uh, about the boy, he's, uh, he's gone. We don't know where he is. He went off several days ago. <laughs> so that was that. I don't know whether they even told my parents. Do you know, I've got an idea if, I'm, if I remember correctly, that they said to me, well, don't mention it to your mum and dad. Do you know, I think that is the case because it would have looked bad on them, wouldn't it? And well, I wouldn't have got whacked anyway because I didn't get whacked. So there we are. There's another little story from decades ago in the old days when I was a boy. I do remember my mum, if I'd given her some lip or if I'd done something naughty, as I walked past, she'd slap my bum. You know, just, just as I walk past, because I remember, and she'll remember this. If if you're listening, Mum, I know you do sometimes listen. You'll remember this. She'd just give me a sort of whack on my bum as I walked past. And I would go flying across the room, crash into the, the table in the kitchen, against the wall. And, oh, 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 dear. As if she'd really, you know, 
struck me with a barge pole or something and I was on the floor on my back oh oh dear dear <laughs> and she said oh get up that was so stupid <laughs> but I always did that if ever I did get a, a passing uh, slap on, on my backside uh, I'd go flying across the room as if she'd uh, really severely damaged me <laughs> she'll remember that today of course it's all turned round if a teacher at school touches a child well, when I say touch, I mean like whack, slap, hit, whatever. Even lay your hand on a shoulder and say, now listen to me, you. That's it, they end up in court. They get the sack, they end up in court, and goodness knows what. In the old days, if you get the cane at school, invariably, with some kids, they go home, their parents would hear about it, and you get the cane again from their dad. You've got, you've got the cane at school, right, that's it, six of the best at home. <laughs> so it was dreadful. Did it do any of us any good or any harm? I don't know. It didn't do me any harm, having the cane, I suppose. It made me dislike the deputy headmaster. I don't think he liked me, and I didn't like him, so that, that was that. I saw him years after I'd left school. I saw him in town one weekend, and I glared at him, and he just glared at me. <laughs> I should have gone and punched him in the face, shouldn't I? How dare you cane me? Now I'm bigger than you, I'll give you... No, no, you can't do that. That's inciting violence, isn't it? But weren't they inciting violence? Teachers, you know, with a bamboo cane, whack whacking kids, is that not making violence OK? Possibly. So then the kids will think, oh, anyone crosses me, I'll go and beat them up. You know, give them a good kicking or something, because that's what happens at school, that's what the teachers do. It's a debate, isn't it, that's going to go on forever. I've heard women on the telly, men on the telly, families, parents. Well, I'm still going to slap them. If they do anything wrong, they're still going to get a spanking, whether it's illegal or not. So I don't know how they're going to police it. There have been cases, I think I'm right in saying, where a child has taken his parents to court. Now, this is how it's all daft these days. I mean, it's not, it's not torture. I don't mean that the child's been severely beaten up and tortured and nearly killed but I mean they've had a spanking they did something wrong they got a whack and they've taken their parents to court I have to there's something else to look up isn't it I'll have to look up on that one imagine taking my parents to court or the school teacher I mean these days teachers get taken to court can you believe it they get the sack what did you do well I slapped some kid because he was being a an idiot. <laughs> I'm trying to find the right word there without getting thrown off the podcast thing. Anyway, there we are. What are your thoughts on all this? Do you slap your kids? Did you get slapped as a kid? I don't know. I, I didn't. None of our kids did. And our grandchildren, so you know, our children's children, they don't get hit. So what are your thoughts on all that? And I'm sure I've mentioned before that back in the 50s, copper would catch you on a building site or something and you get a slap round the head. Especially if he caught you there before, you know, I've told you before, get out of that building site. <laughs> oh. <laughs> you do that again, I'll go and tell your parents, and you get another slap. And that was true. If he went and told your parents that he'd been on the building site again, you get a, a slap from them. <laughs> I, I don't know. Anyway, it's all interesting stuff, isn't it? I know there are two or three, I believe, school teachers that listen to the podcast, so be interesting to hear from you. Would you like to give some of the kids a damn good whacking <laughs> and you can't? Or do you think that's totally wrong and you wouldn't do that no matter what they had done, how bad they'd been? I bet some teachers think, bring back the old days. I don't know about bring back the birch, but bring back the, the old days when I could give them a slap. <laughs> I remember as a child, being taught the difference between right and wrong. Now, you might think, well, yeah, we were all told that. But some kids, I think they weren't taught that. For example, I was taught, you don't steal. You don't steal things from a like a shop or anywhere. You know, if someone at school drops their, their money on the floor, say a 10 shilling note or something, as it was in those days, you don't wait till they've wandered off and then pick it up and pocket it. You say, look, you just dropped this. That's the way I was brought up. I think most people were. But some of the kids at school, they didn't... Either they weren't taught that or... I don't know. But they, they weren't like that. They would steal. I remember a kid, he was always stealing stuff from the local sweet shop. And one day, 
What happened was he'd gone into this sweet shop. No one would go in with him. None of us thought we'd go in with him because we knew he was stealing. One day he went in there. We waited outside. The shop owner had told the police and there was a policeman just down the road from the shop. We hadn't noticed him, but he was waiting down the road. When the kid came out of the shop, the copper came straight up the road, grabbed him and said, right, let's have a look in your pockets. Of course, we're sniggering. We're a few yards away. <laughs> He's got caught. <laughs> anyway, he emptied his pockets and he had sweets and cigarettes and all sorts that he'd stolen from this shop. I think the way he'd done it, the, the way the shop was laid out wasn't very good at all. You could sort of wander easily behind the counter and the woman was out in the back and as she heard a customer, the door would go ding and she heard a customer. By the time she'd come out, he had been very quick, nicked cigarettes and all sorts of things. Anyway, this copper said, where'd you get all the cigarettes? Oh, I bought them and marched him back into the shop. And of course, he hadn't bought them at all. So I don't know what happened to him. But the rest of us, us a lot outside, we wouldn't have dreamed of doing anything like that. You don't go into a shop and steal things. You know, if you can't afford them, if you haven't got the money, you don't have them. And there were only, only a few kids like that. There weren't many children like that. I don't know whether it was bad parenting or whether they were just bad kids. The majority of us would never dream of doing anything like that. Oh, another thing my mother used to say. I hope you are listening, mother. <laughs> If I'd been bad, she'd say, I'll remember this. I will. I'll remember this. And she never did. She always forgot it. I don't quite know what she meant by that. I'll remember this. Possibly if I wanted extra pocket money in the future or something. Oh, no, no. No, because you did that a few weeks ago. I remember that. I must have been about 18 years old. We were coming up to Christmas. And she said to me, are you going to participate this Christmas or just go out and we don't know where you are? <laughs> I said, I'm going out. and You won't know where I am. And another thing she said to me that's always stuck in my mind, I don't know what I'd said. Again, I must have been 18, 19. She said, do you have to continually make lewd comments? And I said, yes, I do. I don't know what I'd said. Lewd comments? Me? I don't know what I'd said. I have asked her since and she can't remember. I think I was totally innocent, don't you? <laughs> I'm pretty sure I've mentioned this before, but people used to say to me when I was at school, Best days of your life. You enjoy it while you can. Best days of your life, the school days. And I used to think, well, if these are the best days of my life, what on earth have I got to look forward to? Nothing could be worse than this. <laughs> when I went to work, I realised they were totally wrong. Work, that was the best days of my life. School was rotten, hated it. Work, oh, fantastic. Working in the radio and TV workshop as a, an apprentice engineer, listening to pirate radio stations, Radio Caroline, Radio London, the lads in the 60s, the girls. Oh, no comparison. School, best days of my life. I should have gone back to those adults that said that and asked them what on earth they're talking about, why they'd lied to me like that. I remember one chap, he was probably 60, sort of something like that, 50, 60. I was mid-twenties, late-twenties. And he said, best years of my life were my forties. He said, how about you? What were the best years of yours? And I said, well, I'm only whatever I was, 30, 25. I've hardly had a life yet. You know, hopefully I'm only sort of a quarter way through, so I've no idea. What an idiot thing to say. There, well, there we are. I did know some idiots in my time. I won't mention them by name when I'm driving. <laughs> I'll say to Trish, I'm surrounded by fools on the roads, you know, surrounded by fools. I don't suffer fools gladly. That's the expression, isn't it? I don't suffer them at all. <laughs> you have to laugh, though. When you're driving, isn't it awful driving on the roads these days? People don't indicate. They just pull out. They, you don't know what they're doing. I don't think they know what they're doing, let alone other people. They indicate right and turn left. And what is it at roundabouts? If they're going straight on they indicate left. There's no left turn, but they indicate left and they're going straight on. It's very confusing. I don't know what they're doing. I've always said to people, especially if they're learning to drive, people that are learning, I've always said, expect the unexpected. You don't expect someone to come out of a turning straight in front of you, but they will. <laughs> they will. They'll do it at some stage. So always expect the unexpected <laughs> and don't believe if they're indicating to come round from the main road into the road you're coming out of, don't believe them. 
They might be indicating to turn into your road, so you think, oh, I'll pull out. I wouldn't do that if I were you, because they're probably not turning at all. They're going straight on, and they'll go straight into the side of you, and it will be your fault. I don't know whether it's true, but many years ago I heard that in America, jaywalking is illegal. If you wander aimlessly like a zombie across the road, you'll get arrested for it. It's a, an offence. I don't think it's an offence here because so many people do it. I don't think it can be an offence. But yeah, jaywalking. I know quite a few of you listening to this live in America. Is that true? Jaywalking is uh, an offence? They've recently changed the rules here. If someone is on the curb waiting to cross a junction, you're going to turn into that junction, even though they're not on the road. It used to be if they've started, they put a foot on the road to cross, it's their right of way. So you mustn't turn into that junction. Now, if they're on the pavement, it's their right of way. Now, you don't know. Are they just standing there, two of them, having a chat about the weather, as us Brits do? <laughs> or are they about to cross? Now, I've seen car drivers stop and sort of wave at the... Are you going? You're not going. Of course, all the cars behind this one have to stop. They wonder what he's doing. He's indicating left, for example, and he, he can't turn left because he's thinking, well, are these people going to step off the pavement, the sidewalk? And if they do, it's their right of way. I'm going to run over them and it's my fault. It's all very confusing now. I don't know why they do it. They've told cyclists that they must ride two abreast in the middle of the lane, as if they're a car. Now, what's that going to do? They're going along at, say, 10 miles an hour. There's a whole trail of cars behind them. I don't know. I'm no, no objection to cyclists. But why have they been told to ride two abreast in the middle of the road so you can't possibly get past? I don't understand that. No doubt someone will email me and put me right. Ah, well, it's because <laughs> motorists shouldn't be on the road at all. Is that the case? Raise rants at protonmail.com. Is it lunchtime yet? I don't know. I dropped Trish in town. I don't know what time she's back, but I'm beginning to get hungry. I told you, didn't I? I've planted the cabbages that we bought. I haven't unloaded the car yet. I've got a, a length of guttering and all the fittings to fit on the shed because the new tortoise area is by the shed. And when it rains, it's all going to go wet his area. So he's had to have guttering. The shed has been there for 20 years no guttering. But now the tortoise is there. So we've got to have guttering because we don't want him to get splashed, do we? We've also bought some big uh, sort of planks of wood like decking because we've got to put them especially round a bit of area just for him. Now we've never had that there before. The, the border that we're talking about has always been fine. But no, that's now the tortoise area. So we have to have the guttering and the special planking around the border to protect him from the plants that he can't eat. And <laughs> so it goes on. Trish, bless her. You have to love her. She's looking up plants. He can't eat this. He can eat that. Mustn't grow this there, but we can grow that there. Honestly, the tortoise, I, he seems to be more important than me. <laughs> That's funny. Does make me laugh. No, I've always said, and Trish reminds me, if you're going to have an animal, whatever it is, if you can't look after it properly, then give it to someone that can. And that is true. I always told her that. Now she reminds me of that. If we can't look after the tortoise properly, then give him to someone who can. And that's true. I agree with that. Can you hear that? I don't know what's happening out there, but someone's got a power tool of some description. <laughs> and it's rather loud. I think it's probably time for me to have a look in the garden anyway and have a cup of coffee. So I shall see you in a while. It certainly has been a while. It's the next day. <laughs> it's Saturday. Uh, ten past three Saturday afternoon. I've been in the garden all day and it is hot. And when I say hot, I mean hot. Under our patio roof, it's, uh, what was it, 24? 24 degrees under the roof. Fantastic. I've got a tan, would you believe, a suntan. I've been creosoting. Well, I say creosote, not allowed to use that anymore. Unless you have a licence, like a farmer or whoever, so I've got substitute creosote, which is not bad, but it's certainly not as good. Now, email from Janice. Hello, Janice. Lovely to hear from you. Janice says that her parents were very, very strict, but she never got smacked. They didn't smack her or anything like that. They were just extremely strict. Now, when she was 15, 
I don't know how old you are now, Janice. But anyway, when you were 15, your friends at school used to meet up in the evenings. They'd go out Saturday downtown and they'd, you know, they'd go around the shops and have some fun. Janice wasn't allowed out. Her parents just said, no, you're not going out. You must do homework. You must go to bed early, blah, blah, blah. So what she used to do, they lived in a bungalow. She used to go into her bedroom, lock the door. Night, mum, night, dad. Yeah, night, sleep well. About eight o'clock in the evening. Out of the bedroom. <laughs> out, I'm just picturing this, Janice. Out of the bedroom window. Sneak through the hedge, apparently, which was at the side of the garden. And go and meet her friends, either in the local park or in the, the town, which wasn't far away, apparently. And she'd get back at half ten, eleven o'clock at night, back through the bedroom window and <laughs> go to bed. Many years later, she says, many years later in her 20s when she was married, she told her parents, she said, I used to sneak off out. And they were horrified, apparently. They had no idea. Absolutely no idea. And apparently they apologised profusely because they realised that all her friends were out. It's difficult, isn't it? I mean, I was working. I went to work when I was 15. I was an apprentice at 15 years old. So to say to me, oh, you can't go out in the evenings, you can't go out on a Saturday or Sunday, well, work Saturdays, can't go out on a Sunday to meet people. I was at work all week, you know. I wasn't a child at school. I suppose I was a child at 15. But I was, uh, well, I say allowed, I just went out. And by the time I got to 16, 17, I was going to nightclubs and uh, drinking beer and <laughs> doing all sorts of dreadfully wonderful things. <laughs> but Janice, thank you for that. So you never got spanked or anything like that. But uh, this is the trouble. I know of someone, this is a few years ago now, their daughter was extremely, oh, what should I say, bad, naughty, rebellious. And they didn't know how to handle it. They grounded her, right? You're not allowed out. So she went out anyway. I mean, short of locking her in her room, which they didn't think was a good idea. Can't keep someone prisoner like that. She was sort of 14, oh, no, 15, 16, I believe, back then. They didn't know what to do. She was awful. Rude to her mother, rude to her father. They didn't spank her or anything like that. They tried to reason with her, and it didn't work until she was about 18, 19, if I remember rightly. She calmed down and apologised for the way she had been in earlier years. Now, that's interesting, isn't it? And she said, I remember them saying to me, I used to go and have a beer with her dad sometimes. He said that she had said, I've no idea why I was like that. I didn't realise how bad I was being at the time. It's only now looking back that she realised. That's interesting. Another email here from Nigel. He says when he was well, from the age of 14, this is in the 50s. So he was 14 in the 50s. He went to work. His parents thought he was... <laughs> <laughs> thought he was going to school. He'd go off in his school uniform, down the road he'd change into a, like overalls, and he went to work in a factory down the road somewhere. And then on the way home, <laughs> he'd change into his school uniform and go, you know, it was awful. I mean, how did you get away with that, Nigel? Stone the crows, how did you get away with that? I mean, the factory must have closed, what, what time were you home? Six? I don't know what time schools closed then, four? perhaps in the afternoon. But he said he got away with that for a couple of years. And eventually, his parents found out. Someone told his dad, not deliberately, uh, according to his email, someone was just chatting, oh, you know, Nigel's got a job there, he seems to be doing well, been there, been there quite some time. And his dad must have been, what? What are you talking about? Nigel, my boy's at school. <laughs> I don't know what age, it was 16. When, in, when I left school in the 60s, the minimum age to leave was 16. I was 15 because I probably told you before, I fell off my bike and ruptured my liver. And it was my bike, not John's. I didn't go on his bike. <laughs> I just fell off and the handlebars swung round, whacked me in the stomach, ruptured my liver. So that was that. I was in hospital and then I had to, uh, what was it they used to call it? Not recuperate. What was it? convalesce. They had convalescent homes back then. So what you would do is you go in hospital, have your operation. Once they're happy with you, you go to a convalescent home and convalesce. I didn't do that. I went home, but I had to convalesce or whatever for quite some time. 
And then eventually I was 15 and uh, I got a job, went out to work. I didn't go back to school. What a relief that was. What a result. So if you want to leave school early, rupture your liver. No, that's not the best way to do it. That reminds me of a few years back. I lost a stone and a half in weight in two weeks. Now, there's a result. What's your secret, you're asking me? How do you do that? I got gastroenteritis. I didn't eat for two weeks. I felt that ill. I just didn't eat for two weeks. Lost stone and a half. Fantastic. <laughs> I could do with losing a stone and a half again now, but I don't think I want to do it that way. No, I definitely don't want to. <laughs> Mark, nice to hear from you. Mark's had an idea. Ask listeners about ghost stories. Have you got any ghost stories? That could be interesting, Mark. We could have a ghost story podcast episode, couldn't we? So, and have you got any ghost stories? Any strange, inexplicable happenings? <laughs> Thumps in the night. Was it bumps in the night, isn't it? And ghosts and stuff. Any any stories like that? Email me, raiserants at protonmail.com. Be interested to hear if you've seen or heard any ghosts. Do you live in an old house, a haunted house? No, I mustn't get carried away. Yeah, good idea, Mark. So send me your ghost stories to me and I shall read them out. That'll be fun. Oh, I've just had a thought. Someone's bound to ask, what is, uh, what was it, a stone and a half I lost? Well, that's 21 pounds, isn't it? I think in America you do it in pounds. Here we now do it in kilos. But I'm stuck with stones and pounds. So, you know, um, 14 pounds and a stone. So 14 plus half a stone, 21. 21 pounds in a week and a half. Well, that wasn't bad going. And I didn't put weight on after that again quickly. I slowly put weight on over quite a period of time. I should have kept my eye on it and I don't know, too late now. Oh, did I tell you I went for an ECG? What is it? Electrocardiograph or whatever. I don't know what it is. Where they stick wires all over you. 12 wires I had stuck on me all over my chest one on each ankle. Brilliant. It was. I like the electronics. I was looking at the machine. The reason was, can you hear that aeroplane? No, that's not an aeroplane. That's a motorbike. Listen to it. Actually, that's relatively quiet. Some of them are really bad. Did I tell you about the ECG? I can't remember. Isn't it awful? I had a thing from the doctor saying, check your pulse. Is it irregular or is it regular? So, well, it was sort of irregular. So I texted back and said irregular. Next minute, I've got an appointment for an ECG. So I went round there. <laughs> lovely nurse, lovely lady. She was chatting away to me, sticking all these wires all over me. Anyway, it was OK. And that was confirmed. The doctor looked at the results and uh, apparently I'm all right. I'm normal. Well, <laughs> I wouldn't say normal, but my heart's perfectly all right, which is good. And they did a blood test for diabetes for some reason. That's OK. I don't have diabetes. So I'm all good to go. I'm beach body ready for the summer. Well, I wouldn't say beach body quite, but uh, <laughs> I'm getting there. At least my heart's OK. My heart's in the right place. <laughs> Happy days. I think I've already told... Did I tell you that yesterday? I don't know. I just can't remember. I haven't told you about my knee, have I? Or have I? My knee has been playing up. I know you're interested. You're thinking, oh, here we go again. Not his knee. We've heard this a hundred times. Just briefly, I spoke to the doctor on the phone. And I said, look, I've seen two paramedics about my knee. I've had an x-ray. I've been to physio. And it's getting worse. It's nearly a year now and it's getting worse. And I said, I've heard talk of an injection. All right, he said, come in, made an appointment. Come in and see me. Three weeks time, I think it is. He said, I'll inject it. <laughs> what do they do? Steroids or something, isn't it? I don't know what they do. He said, you are aware that it may only last for a few weeks or a few months and it may not take the pain away. So I said, yes, I'm aware of that. I wasn't, but I am now. So that's good news. Hopefully my knee will be all right for when we go on our Isle of Wight holiday so I can stomp all over the island without being, well, my knee gives way. I don't know what it is. It's the cartilage, is it? It just gives way. I just almost fall over. I have to grab something, <laughs> stop myself falling over. I don't know about this old age. Well, I'm not even old yet. I don't know what it's going to be like when I am old. I often think back to my younger years when I was early teens and, well, pre-teens. The way I used to run around and leap on my bicycle and race over the woods and climb trees, all sorts of things. And I never thought then that 
you know, one day I won't be able to do all this. It's strange, isn't it? Mind you, getting old, it does have some advantages. I can't think what they are. No, it does. I can potter around the garden now. I don't have to go to work or school, thank goodness. I potter around the garden. I've been out there today, as I said. We've got tadpoles in the pond that I've noticed. In fact, Trish pointed those out yesterday. She said, look, there's tadpoles. Fantastic. I thought they'd all died. Well, I must just tell you, you know, I wake up early in the morning, half past five this morning, birds were singing. Wonderful. I had the window open. It wasn't too cold last night, unlike the previous night. Was it uh, frosty? Two degrees by the time I woke up. Birds were singing this morning. The sun was up. That's more like it. And I remember, now Mervyn has emailed me. This is what reminded me. Mervyn's emailed me and said, did the birds sing more? <laughs> this is interesting, Mervyn. I don't know why you're asking. Did the birds sing more in the mornings in the 50s than they do now? Well, I thought about it. And that reminded me of the old days. My grandfather... He had an old reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder in the 50s and he used to record bird song. And there were loads of birds in the morning, really loads of birds and all day in his garden, all chirping and singing and fluttering about. There are nowhere near as many birds these days. I think it's because there aren't as many insects and that's what they eat. In the, I, th I must have said this before. In the old days, drive along at night in your car, you'll have a look in the morning your headlamps, windscreen, covered in dead insects because they're attracted to the headlamps, aren't they? I remember that, seeing them at night, driving along, especially in a country lane. It was as if it was snowing. The amount of insects all coming towards the car, getting splattered on the headlamps and the windscreen. So yes, Mervyn, there were more birds singing, in other words, more birds, back in the 50s. In fact, I've seen programmes about this where they've said that certain birds are in decline, because the hedgerows have gone, a lot of the woodland has gone, everything is gone, and it's all concrete now. And it really is noticeable driving at night these days. You don't see an insect, there used to be moths, loads of stuff. As I say, it was like snow, but nothing now. If you can hear some sort of creaking in the background, Tricia is in the loft. <laughs> she won't sit down for five minutes. She's now sorting something out in the loft, I don't know what. Lovely email from Karen. Hello, Karen. Karen says that her daughter is 16. What is she doing up there? <laughs> and she's been asking, her daughter's been asking about the old days. So what Karen has done, she said, listen to some of Ray's podcast. So she has, I don't know the daughter's name. You haven't told me that, Karen. But she's apparently hooked on the podcast because she loves hearing about the old days. And Karen has said that her daughter wants to do something to do with history, a historian or something like that. So that's amazing. Well, if it's not motorbikes going past or aircraft from Shoreham Airport going overhead, it's Trisha creaking around in the loft. <laughs> no peace for the wicked, as they say. But um, it's gone quiet up there now. She's either come down or found something to look at. <laughs> Anyway, there we are. I might end the podcast episode soon because it's getting on a bit now. The sun is still shining, so I might make the most of what's left of the sunshine in the garden. Oh, just one more thing. I was talking about uh, forgetting what I've said. I think I've told you twice about the ECG I had and my knee and stuff. I think I've told you twice, so apologies for that. But as people get older, this does happen. I was chatting to a friend of mine on the radio the other day and he said, oh, I've told you I've put up a new aerial. And I said, yeah, you have. Do you know that was the fourth time <laughs> this week, the fourth day in a row that he's told me I bought a new aerial and it does this and it does that and it's really good. Four times he's told me. And I, I told him that. He said, I haven't. I haven't told you the four times. May have mentioned it once. Honestly, I said to him, it's every day. Every single day we have a chat on the radio. Oh, I bought a new aerial. Everyone does it. Trisha's mum, my mum, anyone. Uh, well, I do. I'll start telling someone something. You know, one of the kids. Oh, guess what I did the other day? Yeah, we know what you did. You, you told us several times. Isn't that strange? And one of the worst things that really annoys me, I'll go upstairs to get something or pop downstairs to get something or out to the shed. Then I forget what it was. That happens a lot. I get down to the shed. Now, what did I want? I can't remember. 
And even worse than that, oh, I looked that up on the computer. So I grabbed the iPad or sit at my PC, only seconds later, and I've forgotten what, what was I going to look up. I can't remember. And I've only just seconds ago, as I sat down to have a look, forget what I'm looking at. I don't know. I don't know what's happening. <laughs> I can't remember things. Isn't it dreadful? But I know that this happens to younger people as well. It's not just when you get old. I've, I know younger people that have said the same. Oh, I go upstairs for something. When I get there, I forget what it was. <laughs> Right, for those who like the weather report or forecast tomorrow, uh, which is Sunday the, what, 9th of, are we in April? Yes, we are, 9th of April, 23. Tomorrow is meant to be a lovely day like today, sunshine all day long, which is good. Monday, we're back to rain. <laughs> oh dear, but we never seem to be able to get away from the rain. A few days, oh look, summer's here. No, no, that's the end of that. <laughs> Cold, wet, windy, dreadful. Never mind, we are getting there slowly. Hopefully this summer we will get some nice days. Last summer was red hot. It was too hot at times. Hopefully we'll have a nice summer this year, especially now I've got all the, the vegetables and all the seeds coming on. Right, it's still sunny. The time is 10 to 5. That's gone quickly. I'm going to head off into the garden. Thanks for listening. If anyone is still with me, you're still listening or have you, have you all cleared off ages ago? Thanks for listening. Raise rants at protonmail.com. Love to hear from you. I will see you on Wednesday with yet another midweek message. Take care. Bye bye for now.